our first speaker is going to be uh, Becky Smethurst. Uh, Becky is a research fellow at the University of Oxford. And our research field is uh, active galaxy, uh, galaxy uh, nuclei. She's going to talk on um, uh, Galaxy Zoo and the Zoo universe. So Becky, I give you the floor and I'll give you a five minute time. Great, thank you. Thank you so much um, to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you today about you know, how we can use citizen science to classify our data, both in this age of big data that we find ourselves in now, and also moving forward into the next decade, how can we combine citizen science with machine learning as the new generation of telescopes and surveys come online? Because the biggest data sets we've had to deal with so far is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Some 4 million spectra taken, right? 2 million galaxies identified, half a million quasars, 800,000 stars. I think that classifies as big data in anyone's book. And SDSS have done a fantastic job at making that data public. The question that everyone had uh, from Galaxy Zoo is how do we classify that data so that it's actually useful to do some science? one of the hardest things to classify is the shape. It's not something that can be accurately parameterized with a single number. You know, people have tried with things like concentration and asymmetry, but there's just so much variation in both, you know, the shape across the population, but also, you know, in the noise across images, depth of image, everything like that. And so it's very, very difficult to do at least for uh, a parameterized version of morphology, but also uh, for a machine to do as well. So that's why back in 2007, Galaxy Zoo was launched. It was a citizen science project and a website online that got volunteers to classify the shape of a galaxy so that morphological studies of, of large populations of galaxies could be done. So this was Galaxy Zoo 1, essentially started with all sort of a million Sloan images. And it was a simple elliptical or spiral question. See, there's a couple of sort of things in there about anti-clockwise spirals and clockwise spirals and everything like that. It was a fun result. Uh, someone can ask me about it if they're interested later. And one of the things I love about this image is just how old school internet this looks. I feel like I'm back in like high school <laughs> all over again when I see this. You're happy to know that Galaxy Zoo looks a bit more like this now, a lot more slick, a lot more modern internet like we're used to. We're on something like the fifth iteration of Galaxy Zoo now. And you can see we're asking much more detailed questions about spiral arm windings, the number of spiral arms a galaxy has. And I like to say, you know, this is a task that even a five-year-old, if they're keen, could do, right? So it's, it's something that's nice and simple for humans. And Galaxy Zoo spawned off, you know, hundreds, if not thousands now, of other projects that come under the banner of the Zooniverse, you know, everything from classifying penguins in Antarctica to uh, transcribing World War II diaries. You know, there's lots of different projects going on um, from rece researchers that all need help classifying data. And that's because of the success of Galaxy Zoo. So back at, when it first launched in 2007, you know, the, the astronomers who were on board didn't really have an idea of how popular it would be. There was actually a server meltdown after three hours of the launch. Um, and I think that was because the PI went on to BBC Radio 4. Uh, be careful with it. It's a dangerous beast and should be used carefully because it turns out the Radio 4 audience are very keen to get involved with something like this when you tell them, hi, we need your help to classify galaxies for science. <laughs> And in the end, the actual whole project was completed in six months with over 300,000 people classifying each of the 1 million Sloan images over 40 times each. As I said, still going though, because obviously we've got lots of different surveys. The current one that's just finished, I think we're sort of very close to finishing decals now as well, which is very, very exciting. What it gives you Galaxy Zoo though, is a vote fraction essentially for the percentage of people who said that a specific galaxy was a disk or a bar or a merger or something like that. So essentially it gives us a very nice database that we can use to pull out what we're interested in, right? So here I'm showing the percentage of people who said each of these galaxies was a disk, which these 10 examples, you can see it goes from the least disky up in the top left there to the most disky in the bottom right that 99% of people agreed was a disk. And you can see it's a beautiful spiral galaxy. 
And so what that's led to now, as of last week, it's led to a lot of science, right? There's 432 papers on ADAS that mention Galaxy Zoo in the abstract and 1,550 that mention it somewhere in the text, which I think is an incredible number. It just reflects, you know, the impact of having this database so publicly available to people as well. And so this is the crucial thing here, right? It's the science part of citizen science. Sure great project, gets people involved, 300,000 people, you know, over a million on this universe as a whole, looks good for your impact, the ref and all that sort of things. But at the end of the day, it's the scientific studies are what are important. So before we get to the sort of combining citizen science and machine learning, I just want to highlight a few results that were actually made possible due to Galaxy Zoo. So the first one of those, and I think the biggest that's probably most well known, is some of the earlier work that was done by um, Karen Masters and Kevin Chavinsky, showing that blue ellipticals and red spirals, which I'm showing on that bottom row there, weren't actually as rare as originally thought by sort of the astronomers throughout the, the 20th century. So in fact, red spirals make up 30% of the spiral galaxy population, and blue ellipticals roughly 10% of the elliptical population. And so that's not exactly what I would class as, as rare anymore for, in terms of what we can find in Galaxy Zoo. And I think this really was down to the power of, of citizen science, being able to classify, first of all, a large amount of galaxies so that you could get this kind of statistic, sure. But also the fact that the public had no preconceived notions of color equals shape. The fact that something that looks red would more likely be classed as an elliptical for them. They had no preconceived notions of that. They were completely unbiased, which really was sort of the, the, the strength of, of the crowd here, I think. And I think it's still worth noting that, you know, despite these results, they're over a decade old now, there are still some papers which, you know, very sort of simply cut their sample based on color and say that this is a morphological split. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> and, you know, we've got all these data tables open. So if, you, if you're doing something like this, I really strongly encourage you to, to grab the Galaxy Zoo tables to make sure that if you're trying to spit on morphology, you know, you can do it uh, with some accuracy. This also feeds into uh, much more recent work back in 2019 that was led by, again, by Karen Masters that we did together with the team. Um, and with this, we wanted to highlight the issues with the famous Hubble tuning fork that I'm showing in the right there. This is sort of the bread and butter for classifying galaxies, right? Um, and it's how we've done it for a long time. And you'll see on, on both the spiral tracks where, where Hubble decided there was different classifications, we move from an A classification, an SA to an SC. And as we move from SA, we go from very tightly wound spiral arms with a very large bulge, all the way to SC, which is much more loosely wound spiral arms with a very small bulge. But actually, when you look in Galaxy Zoo, as you can see in that sort of table of galaxies I'm showing down below, you find all different combinations of tightly wound with a small or a large bulge or loosely wound arms with a small or a large bulge. And the thing was, you know, I think people had assumed that well, they were quite rare. The things with um, tightly wound arms, but very small bulges and the things with loosely wound arms and dominant bulges. I think people thought it, they'd be very rare if we looked at them. But that wasn't the case when we actually looked again at the classifications. Of, so I'm showing here on the uh, x-axis, this is how uh, large the bulge is, it's sort of a weighted average from the vote fractions we get. And then on the y-axis, it's how tightly wound the spiral arms are. And if you, um, the tuning fork was sort of the, the, the be all and end all, what you would expect is this diagonal correlation here from SCs in the bottom corner with very small bulges loosely wound all the way up to SAs in the top right. But as you can see, that's that's not what we see at all. And sort of, it sort of really changed our idea of how we might classify galaxies and sort of we got rid of maybe, not we got rid, we're never gonna get rid of the Hubble tuning foot probably, but it really did make us rethink how that actually happens. Cause we can see that the majority of galaxies actually have you know, very fairly small bulges and tightly wound arms and don't fall into those discrete categories that were outlined by Hubble either, right? This is a very continuous, uh, sequence. And so that's another thing that I think galaxies usually help to highlight. The tuning fork is discrete, right, in its classification of galaxies, meaning there is some threshold that we can draw 
to say this is the split between spiral things and elliptical things. And this is one of the obviously the big questions in, in galaxy evolution is, is, you know, how do you evolve uh, from one to the other? And so this is why this split is very, very important. But firstly, when we observe galaxies, we have all of the inherent observational biases that blur that line, first of all. But then also the classifications we make, whether they're analytical, like concentration or asymmetry, or whether they're, say, bulge to total mass ratio uh, in a galaxy as well, or even the vote fractions from Galaxy Zoo, they're all continuous and not discrete. And so I think there's a lot of error that comes when people try and map those continuous uh, classification systems to a discrete system that we're familiar with in terms of Hubble. And so when you have vote fractions like this, the question is, from Galaxy Zoo, I should say, where do you put that threshold then? So that's a, just a very arbitrary sort of histogram of the you know vote fraction of being a disc. Do you put your threshold at 50% of people said it was a disc, 70% of people said it was a disc. And so that was a big discussion early on in Galaxy Zoo. You know, how are people going to use these vote fractions that we, we gave them? And we suggested, OK, if you want a very, very clean sample, then you should say everything that everybody agrees, at least 70 percent agreement uh, is a spiral galaxy, is a disk galaxy. And similarly for ellipticals, everything that everybody agrees is 70 percent agreement, then uh, uh, that's an elliptical. But the thing is, by doing that, you lose so many galaxies in this uncertain region in the middle that is sort of shaded with yellow there. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm not really partial to throwing out data. <laughs> I really like to hold on as much as my sample as I can. And so when I came to do my PhD and came into the, the, the Galaxy Zoo team, uh, I was very keen to, to use these vote fractions in a different way. And so uh, in my way, I'd use this example from 2016. I've sort of veered away from using thresholds and instead I use the classifications provided by the citizen scientists on Galaxy Zoo as weights. So this was a study of mine that inferred the quenching histories of galaxies using photometry from SDSS and Galax. And it showed that rapid recent quenching was happening in AGN hosts, but not in inactive galaxies. So every single galaxy in my sample is in that blue curve there. It's just that they're weighted by the smooth vote fraction from the galaxy, the percentage of people that thought that galaxy was an elliptical galaxy. And every single galaxy is also in, in my sample is also in that white curve, showing the same thing, except it's weighted by the percentage of people that thought the galaxy was a disk. And so I think the strength of this work really came from, you know, not using a threshold and instead treating the vote fractions as weights, which meant that as Anthony is, is so beautifully showing there, no data was, was thrown away, which I reckon is, is something to celebrate. Always, always, always. The problem comes with if you don't want to throw data away, what do you do when your data sets are even bigger? And so this is what sort of scares me and keeps me up at night is the fact that LSST is coming. Um, and it's supposed to be, you know, the idea is identifying 1 billion galaxies. <laughs> that would mean we're scaling up sort of the original first iteration of Galaxy Zoo a thousand times. It's just not scalable. Hell, even Euclid is coming in with 50 million galaxies soon, and that's not scalable for what we've been doing either. For this, we're, we're going to have to bring in the machine learning big guns, which have really obviously improved since 2007 at this uh, task of uh, classifying the shapes of galaxies. And the rudimentary way to do this is to use humans, human classified data to produce a training set for a machine. So you citizen scientists classify, you label, you label, you use that to train the machine, maybe to classify LSST images or Euclid images or whatever. But even if you have a 99.9% .9 accurate machine on a billion galaxies, that still leaves a million inaccurately classified. So the machine is always going to need help. And I think that's really nicely illustrated here. This is actually supernova data. So a little bit of a, uh, a turn off from galaxies here. This is actually one of the Zooniverse's supernova hunting projects led by Darrell Wright using PanStars data. And essentially in this project, people were asked to flag if something had changed in a new image compared to a library image, like I'm showing on the left there. And therefore, if they're flagging it, they're saying, yeah, it's worth investigating. It's worth some follow-up. And so a machine was essentially also trained to do the same thing. And so in the, the graph on the right there, I'm showing um, the human score on the y-axis. So, um, you know, what percentage of people basically said that it was worth following up? And then a similar thing from a machine, which was trained to do the same thing. 
So we're comparing, you know, how likely is it something has changed in a given image? You know, what does a human say? What does a machine say? And after those uh, classifications have been made, an expert has then gone through all of those and flagged them as good or a possible follow up. They flag them as if they're an asteroid instead, which often crop up on, on supernova images when you're trying to search them, or possibly even garbage, you know, like cosmic rays, et cetera, like that in the green points that you can see there. And so this was done for a, for a small sample. And so the idea is that you look at the classifications in this small sample and decide if there's some threshold in score above which you would follow up on observations so that you could then scale that to a much larger scale when you get more data later. So essentially you want to look for the line that you can draw that selects the most red and yellow things and the least green things. And I hope what you can see is that that's not a horizontal or a vertical line. I.e. so if it was a horizontal, horizontal line, you would just be ignoring the machine score and you'd only be looking at the human score. If it was a vertical line, you'd be ignoring the humans and only looking at machine score. I hope you can see that to get the most red things and the least green things, I, the most things that you should follow up on and the green things that you should probably just ignore, is a diagonal line, right? It's a combination of the two. It's machines and humans working together. And that's the key thing that I want to take forward now into the rest of this talk, machines and humans working together. So how can we apply that to our problem of galaxy classification? Well, let's actually sort of look at some of the images we're actually trying to classify here. I think these are from decals, if I remember right. There's just so many surveys these days, I can't keep on top of it. Now, about a third of these galaxies that you can see here, I hate to say it, but they are boring. I mean, they are from a machine learning point of view anyway, maybe not an astrophysics point of view. I know there's probably some people out there that elliptical galaxies are their babies and they're very, very protected by them. But from a machine learning point of view, they're very boring. We would expect any model to learn to recognize the sort of, you know, very smooth fuzzy blobs after fairly few examples. Whereas in the early days of Galaxy Zoo, you know, we were showing hundreds of thousands of these kind of fuzzy blob images to, you know, millions of volunteers. You know, each of them were classified 40 odd times. You don't need to classify them 40 odd times by the time that, you know, five people have told you 100% that's just a fuzzy blob. It's just not efficient. And it's not fair on our volunteers either. And it, the same thing is true if, you, if you've got a machine, you know, it's much more efficient if it can classify them very, very quickly. So ideally, we would only show the volunteers, our citizen scientists, the images that the model most needs help with. So the model should be able to ask, hey, I'm really uncertain about these galaxies. Can you label them for me, please, so I can learn more about them? The humans would then label them. The model would retrain itself with only those most informative galaxies. This is what we call active machine learning, machine learning that is happening in real time as people classify galaxies. And it's really best used when classifying is very expensive. So a fixed number of volunteers, a very large number of galaxies. And obviously the catch is, how do we know which images the model is uncertain about? So deep learning only gives you a, a scalar prediction for each of the classification you make. So what we really want to know is the uncertainty around that prediction. And so these slides I've, I've lifted straight from Mike Wormsley. I'm gonna put my hands up and say that he is heading up the work in the Galaxy Zoo team. He's a senior PhD student at Oxford. He's pretty sure he's on the job market this year as well. So if you wanna know more detail about this, then please speak to him because he's probably the best person. For those at least that everything on my slide now means something too. Now, for those who have no idea what in the universe this slide is actually saying, the gist here is that we use a convolutional neural network. And what that's able to do is actually make an estimate for how uncertain it is of its classification or label of a galaxy. I, the machine itself can decide probabilistically what it needs the most help with. And so here's what sort of those galaxies look like. The ones that on the left-hand side are the ones that the machine needs the most help with. And the ones on the right-hand side are the ones that, you know, if the machine has decided it will get very little insight if it shows one of those images on the right there to a human to classify. It's already very certain of its classification and getting confirm confirmation from a human of the fact that that's just a fuzzy blob, uh, you know, would not be helpful. It, it's already a certainty to the machine. Whereas those most featured galaxies on the left-hand side there, 
are the galaxies that the machine learns the most from getting a human to classify for it, which is, uh, you know, unsurprising if you, if you think about it. It's probably some feature that's ever so slightly different from a feature that it's, it's seen before. And so I like to think of this as the most and least informative uh, galaxies, you know, how much better do we constrain the model having the humans label that particular galaxy? How informative is it for the machine to learn from that galaxy if it were labeled? And I think it's this, the machine deciding itself what needs to be shown to a human is what makes Mike's work really, really cool in my book. This is actually live on Galaxy Zoo now as well. So by choosing the enhanced classification arc rather than the classic, which just, you know, just lets you see a random galaxy from the sample as usual. And we've made sure to be very open with our citizen scientists, with our volunteers about what we're asking them to do. So, you know, first that's why we give them a choice, uh, first of all, because some people prefer just a random sample, but we explain that the enhanced workflow, you know, is more efficient although they're not necessarily seeing every single galaxy in the sample, because I think that's what's quite attractive about citizen science and big data is that you, know, you could discover anything. Um, but they're really seeing the ones that the machine needs the most help with, and that will make us more efficient and get more science done. And so, you know, honestly, those tend to be the most interesting galaxies to look at anyway. And so it makes the task more, more fun. And we find that about 90% of our users actually choose this option as well. And I believe Mike is also currently working on how this sort of active learning can be applied to the classification of fast radio bursts and all that kind of stuff as well. So it's very exciting stuff. So I hope with this, I've, I've managed to convince you that the fact that LSST is coming isn't so dark and terrible after all. Uh, we've, all we've been able to um, bring machines and humans together to classify data efficiently on these smaller data sets. And so because we've rolled out these tools on these smaller data sets, I say small, small in today's standards anyway, that, you know, as I said at the beginning, they're probably uh, classed as big data to anybody. But because they've been rolled out on the small data sets, it means that when the time comes, we can tackle whatever size data set is thrown at us, you know, in the coming era of really, <laughs> really big data. And hopefully uh, it'll feel like peanuts to us. Thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Becky, for this uh, very nice uh, talk. I think I will uh, play you a big, big applause <laughs> from the big crowd of participants. And we have received uh, a number of, uh, of questions. There are mm -hmm. uh, two questions and, uh, and one comment. So a first question from uh, Haro Verkuter is, um, on your slide with the red dots and the purple dots, um, the, the, the question is, it looks like the, the machine learning is, is better in classifying than the humans. There is less horizontal spread in the red points. Um, so could you, could you comment on this? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, it does indeed look like the machine is sort of at first glance because you have that sort of, I don't know if anyone can see my mouse. Uh, I probably can't. Um, you have that sort of concentration of red points in the, in the top right corner, right? And so if you made a split, it's say a machine score of 80%, um, you would get most of those in. The problem is that you'd also get all of the, the green things that have a very low human score as well. So I think the key thing there is that the red points are in the top right corner right? They're not just on the right hand side. And so that's why um, if you have the, the, the vertical line there, you're still going to get so much garbage that's been labeled by an expert as garbage uh, in your sample that you want to follow up on. And that's why the diagonal line is the thing that, okay, maybe that diagonal line needs to be shifted up slightly. <laughs> I think that was just for, uh, for demonstration, for visualization. Um, that's why with the diagonal line, you would... Um, you would get the highest um, proportion of the, the red points that the, the, that the good that you want to follow up on and the least proportion of garbage things. Cause that's the thing you want to try and um, get rid of. You don't want to follow up on things that uh, don't turn out to be supernova because that's expensive in terms of um, follow up time. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question is how do you know that uh, in the universe that you're only showing galaxies and not other objects, nebulae or blob-shaped other objects. 
Yeah, um, so that comes from the survey pipelines. Usually, for example, SDSS do a very, very good job of um, classifying through the pipeline, um, whether it is a galaxy or a star, usually from the spectra alone, doesn't necessarily classify, obviously, the shape of the galaxy, which is what we're interested in. It just classifies not a star, not a nebula, not a quasar galaxy. Uh, and so that comes from the SDS pipeline. And one more question from Alex Mishayakov. How many galaxies we need to be lab labeled in order to annotate 1 billion, so 1A9 LSST objects? Yeah, good question. So um, that's sort of one of the things that we've been trying to, to answer with this. Um, I know uh, that there was a uh, these Kaggle competitions that gets people to do um, some, you know, sort of uh, software writing in order to try and you know, crack one of these competitions where, where given an aim. And that was done with uh, the Sloan Galaxy Zoo. Um, and I remember with the huge data set that they had, the winning entry to the Kaggle competition, actually what they did was quadruple the data set by realizing that the classification is rotationally invariant. So if you have an image of a galaxy, you can rotate it, you know, keep going 90 degrees until you have sort of like the, the, the four uh, sort of main rotations of it and the classification doesn't change. And so the guy who won it actually managed to do that and quadruple his data set. And that made him much more accurate in terms of classifying compared to the humans uh, as anyone else did. And so that meant he needed like 4 million to be accurate on a sample of a million, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but I think that's getting, getting better. Uh, I think with this active learning in the background, um, starting people, you know, starting the machine off being trained um, on a sample that's much smaller, perhaps sort of the first 50,000 or so will at least get you the efficiency boost that you need to classify the easy things. And then it's the classifying the hard things that I think will take a, a lot longer. Um, but you won't need to classify as many as if you'd, you'd done the traditional get a human to classify a million things and then train a machine. And I think that's another strength of the active learning. Um, I think we um, might have, okay, Becky, you're online right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, at least there was some interruption. Oh. I don't know if anybody else, uh, don't know if anybody else answered the, uh, the, got the answer to the last question. Yes. I can say it again right if now? not. Okay. Uh -huh. yes, yes. okay. Was fine, yeah, okay. Good. We have a follow-up to our Overcooter question. Mm -hmm. And in the plot between human score and machine score, mm -hmm. there were in this plot here displayed, there were no samples uh, having a machine score less than 0.5. Yes. What does it mean? And is there no instance where the machine is completely wrong? Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. That was just a, an initial cut that uh, I think Daryl had done on the machine score um, to sort of throw out anything that was less than that already. Um, I'm not sure why. Again, this plot is stolen from Daryl, so <laughs> I guess we could uh, I could go ask him. Um, but I think it was just an initial cut on the machine score that he'd already done, um, possibly because he knows the machine quite well and knows that anything that's um, below that point is probably not worth investigating. So it'll all be in that paper that's linked to the top. So if you're extra interested, I'd check that out. It's a good paper. Pascal, you're muted. Okay, I'm mute, okay. We have one, one person uh, having the hands up and that's Jorge. And I will ask him to uh, unmute. Yeah. And to ask the question then. And after that, I will uh, take one more question from Andreas Wichenek, a comment from Peter, and we will stop with a question. Uh, Jorge, could you? Unmute and uh, ask your question. Oh. 
Okay, I don't see Jorge online, but maybe while he's coming, I will bring the question from Andreas Vichenek. Mm -hmm. If you would overplot the galaxies, the machine thinks it needs help with, how would the plot look like? Um, plot, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what plot I'm making there. Did you say that again? If you would overplot, so probably on the on the red and the purple plot, if you would overplot the the galaxies, the machine thinks in it helps with, so the the galaxies that are not mm -hmm. so classified by the machine, how yeah. would the, the plot look like? Yeah, so you can't make an analogous plot because you obviously don't get like a, a similar score in that respect. I imagine that um, what you would find is that the machine score is very uncertain. So if we go back to uh, Mike's uh, slide, you can see these sort of like little posterior functions that he's got here is very various different sort of iterations of the machine. It's very uncertain in the fact that it's, it's very broad. So if you think about that as the machine score that we had before, but obviously there's not an equivalent uh, human score uh, you would maybe ask sort of three or four people and then all of a sudden that would make the machine score very, very certain and it would perhaps jump this way as, as you um, jump to the right sort of, I just realized no one can see my mouse, sorry. <laughs> uh, it would jump to the right as, as you got more um, certain of your classification or you would jump somewhere, I guess. And so um, there's not an analogous plot that can be made, uh, but you can imagine it, I guess, as going from, you know, somewhere in the middle, uh, moving around because the machine is very uncertain and then and then a human score uh, making the machine much more certain in, it, in its answer. So. Good. Then we have a comment from Peter Skoda mm -hmm. uh, mentioning that the, the principle of active learning is cross-entropy ordered and um, uh, have also applied this. Uh, this is in the in the talk uh, comments. Mm -hmm. so anybody can see it. Uh, and they have applied it to finding emission spectra in LAMOS. So nice. And then there was also a hand uh, raised by Jorge Garcia. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand again. Otherwise, we will. Uh, conclude this uh, this talk and thank you very much